Please arise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Sunday is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. 
Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Here ends the lesson. We read responsively Psalm 23 as printed in the bulletin. The sorrows of death compassed me. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. In my distress I called upon the Lord, and he heard my voice out of his temple. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rock and your shadow are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The sorrows of death compassed me. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. In my distress I called upon the Lord, and he heard my voice out of his temple. The Holy Epistle is recorded for us in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 24, through chapter 10, verse 5. Do you not know, brethren, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Here ends the, the epistle. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Please arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, recorded for us in the Gospel given through St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 20 at the first verse. At that time, Jesus taught, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, 
you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your, your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God who saved us. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words on which we meditate this morning are the words of the gospel lesson that you have just heard. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this is an interesting time of the church year. It sort of um, baffles most of us to some extent. We go from Epiphany to these three Gesima Sundays, the counting Sundays, where today we're roughly 70 days out from uh, the celebration of the resurrection. Uh, Queen Quagesima will be roughly 50 days out from, uh, I forget if it's... Uh, Palm Sunday or if it's Good Friday, I forget how that all works out together. And you have to subtract the Sundays that are in Lent because they are in Lent, but they are not of Lent, etc., etc. We've gone from white to green and all of these sorts of things. And there are some things to note, um, even with our text, that maybe help guide us. Historically speaking, these three Sundays were the time that the ministers began to fast and to prepare themselves for the season of Lent when everybody else is encouraged to fast. And so in these three Sundays, you would do well to think about how you might observe the fast. So these three Sundays can, on the one hand, be divided up grace alone, scripture alone, and faith alone. You'll see that Sunday by Sunday as we go through. And you might consider how you will spend more time in God's word during the season of fasting. Ash Wednesday has a lesson from the Old Testament that sort of lays out what fasting is all about. There are certain things that are sort of assumed there. And one of them is that the ministers will indeed weep and pray a little more for God's people and for our situation as human beings. And in fasting is a spiritual discipline that helps us because we are taking something that if we fail at it, it's not, no, not that big of a deal. I would encourage you not to take an oath in regard to your fasting. That when you look at your life and you say, I'm going to watch less Netflix because everything I watch there, you know, in one way or another is so foul. So during Lent, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to make an effort on it. I would encourage you not to take an oath to God in that regard, but just let it be something that you determine. Because in that way, if you fail, you haven't really sinned, have you? other than if you're engaging in sin and you're trying to refrain from that, and you've sinned in that way. But when you take an oath to God, that's a very, very serious thing. Okay? But in the discipline of fasting, we learn that we do have a great deal of power over sin. You're not going to completely conquer it in your life. We're going to come full circle to what this text has a lot to do with today, okay? But you do have the ability to say no to sin. And there are things that we learn from the fasting. We remove ourselves physically from where the temptation is found. We learn to exercise our will in something that doesn't matter that much. So when it does matter, we have exercised our will. We've made it strong. If you work out on a regular basis, you are working out in something that doesn't matter. Lifting weights? 
in the short term, what's it for? You're not putting food on a shelf or storing grain in a barn or anything like that. You're just lifting weights for what? But it makes you stronger so that when you need those muscles, you've got them. So it is with the seasons of fasting. You exercise yourself spiritually so that when you need it, you've got it. And you always remember that if you fail, if you fail, you've got a savior. I don't know if you noticed a little change in the collect today. It wasn't Jesus Christ our Lord, it was Jesus Christ our Savior, which has everything to do with our text this morning. Jesus had been talking to his disciples, and you know, unless you basically give up your life, which is an interesting concept, and follow me, and, you know, Peter said, look, Lord, we've dumped everything to follow you. We've given it all up. What about us? Oh, yeah. Anyone who has given up house and home, field and cattle, whatever, for the gospel and for me, will not fail to receive a hundredfold in the here and now. You know, congregations and widows that you need to look after, etc., etc., in the here and now. And in the end, oh, that's right, just like everybody else, eternal life. And then Jesus tells this parable, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went to find workers for his vineyard. And after this text, <laughs> James and John's mother <laughs> comes to Jesus. Jesus says, what can I do for you? Grant that my sons in the kingdom of heaven might sit on your left and on your right. I would make a mother's heart so glad. Oh, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Isn't it interesting that this parable that would teach us to be humble is right between conceit and conceit. Well, look at me, look at me. I don't know about you, but I find pastoral conceit to be one of the most disgusting things, just absolutely repulsive. But the temptation is certainly there. And as we begin these three Sundays where the ministers are supposed to be looking at their own life before we start talking to everybody else about theirs, Jesus is basically saying, get over yourself. It's by grace. If you have been called to work in the kingdom from infancy on up, you are so blessed. But we human beings, our eye is evil because God is good. And don't the scoffers question, how can there be evil in the world if there is a God? And I'm not going to believe in a God that allows evil in the world, except that if you think it through, if there is no God, there cannot be any such thing as evil. There only is whatever is. If everything is by chance, who is to say what is evil? How, how can you possibly assert that anything would be evil and conversely anything would be good? But because there is a God who is truly good, we see that the devil wants to rule in place of God and feeds to mankind the lie. Oh. You can be more like God than you already are. In fact, you don't need God. You can be God. Worship yourself. You determine what is. You determine who you are and what you are. And on and on and on. And if reality gets in the way, simply close your eyes, stick your fingers in your ears, go na, 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 and really believe. Because if you really believe, you see, because God is good, our eye, our perception, is evil. Work is good. We're constantly hearing in the news what the unemployment level is in the United States because we understand work is good. Now, there are those who would come to you and try to put you into conflict with your employer if you have one or with your employees if you're the employer. And to be sure, we live in a sinful world and sinful things happen and sinful attitudes are there. But work is good. 
If we work for a company, why would we not be proud of the product that it makes? Why would we not be proud of the work that we do, whatever it is, in that company, so it can be the best product there for the people who might buy it, so that our company does well, and we, as the company prospers, we also prosper. We, too, have food on the table. We live in a remarkable time in our country. We can think that as a common laborer, we might make more or less than somebody else in, in Jesus' day. If you went to work for a day, you got paid for a day's work. It's kind of how it was. It didn't so much matter what you were doing. So when Jesus told this parable, there's a landowner who went out looking for workers in his vineyard. And he hired people, and they agreed to work for the day and to receive a day's wages, a denarius. Okay, everything is good. And the landowner goes out to find more workers for his vineyard. And we're not told if this is an issue of he just doesn't have enough employees, or if he recognizes how good he has it, that he owns the vineyard, and he will be okay. He has food for the day. He has something that is his, that he lives and works in, and everything's okay. And recognizing that, he sees that there are those in the marketplace looking to be connected to a vineyard, looking for a place to work so that they know that they and their families will be taken care of. So the owner of the vineyard goes out. He finds others. You come and work. And he says these remarkable words. Whatever is right, that's what I will pay you. Oh, okay. Down to the people who are hired at the very end of the day. And when we see the end of the matter, we begin to get the idea that the landowner has compassion, that he knows that people need to eat, that they need to be associated with his vineyard in order for everything to be okay in their lives. You're going to work for one hour, and whatever is right, that's what I will pay you. And at the end of the day, he tells his steward, Pay the laborers their wages, starting with the last to the first. And he has told his steward, give everybody a day's wage. You worked for one hour. Here's a day's wage. <gasps> wow, what's he going to pay me? I worked all day. A day's wage. Well, how is that fair? It's not fair. That's the point. It's not fair. It never was intended to be. God is love. God is compassionate. It's not about what we earn. It's about the fact that God is good. He is kind. He is loving. He calls and calls and calls. And if we sit back and think, well, fine, then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to enter the kingdom of heaven until the last hour. Well, first of all, you have no idea when that last hour is. And secondly, you spend all of your life with the fear that Christ might return and the door is now closed. Now is the time. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to trust. And do not look at the work you do as something horrible. Is it work? Of course it is. Think about all those prophets in ancient times, or even Jeremiah that we heard about today. You're going to go. You're going to preach to everyone I tell you to preach to. They're not going to like it. They're going to reject you. They're going to treat you terribly. Yeah, that's right. Whether it's your pastor, who on the one hand probably has it easier than you do in many ways, because I deal mostly with you, I deal mostly with the faithful. It's kind of easy in that regard. You're the ones going to work. 
You're the ones with your unbelieving relatives. You're the ones out there in the world dealing with all that stuff, shall we say, where people attack you and don't want to hear it and put you down and call you into human resources to try and reprogram you to accept things that you know are really not good. And it's not so much that you find them repulsive, you may or may not, but the fact of the matter is that they are in harm's way. They are in harm's way. That's really the reason we would talk to them. And so it is. You labor. You do. It is work. It is the heat of the day in many cases. Yes, it is. But what joy there is. If you talk to somebody and talk to them and labor with them day after day after day, and then you find out that somebody else God used to finally say it one more time, or in some slightly different way, and before they drew their last breath, they came to faith. And what is the reward? In the end, eternal life. And when you find them there in heaven, you can throw your arms around them, and they around you, and you can hear them say, thank you for caring, even when I was spiteful or told you to talk to the hand, or crossed my arms and said, I'm not coming to dinner anymore, mom or dad, or brother or sister, or son or daughter, if you're gonna keep bringing this stuff up. Thank you for caring, in spite of all of that. It's work, it's labor. Jesus has no delusions about these things. That's right, in the heat of the day. But what peace is ours to know that we're taken care of. We have Jesus, not merely our Lord, who will return in glory and judge us. We have Jesus, our Savior, who by his grace welcomes into his kingdom here and now that we may work there too. Many are called. You are called. I am called. Many others are called. In fact, in some way, at some level, every human being is called. And God would have us labor in his vineyard, pruning and picking so that they may hear the call. And by his grace, they too may be in the vineyard and have eternal life, where we won't think about how hard it was to work in the heat of the day when everything was against us. But we will rejoice at all the people that are there. We will rejoice that God is truly good, that by his grace, he saved us. Hey, think about it. Jesus had the good life. All he had to do was kick back in heaven and enjoy. But he came in the heat of the day. And he labored, and he labored hard, and was rejected, and spit on, and beaten, and nailed to a cross to die, so that you and so that I can have eternal life by his grace as a gift from him. And he privileges us then then we might indeed work in his kingdom that others may know this incredible joy and have peace even now. It is joyful work. So as we come to the season of fasting, it is a somber time to be sure, but it is not without joy and purpose, for God is good. God grant that by his Holy Spirit, our eye is good. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us arise and pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless Sharon Kennedy's sister struggling with ALS, that you would grant her appropriate treatment, and above all, that you would continue to draw her to the only savior of mankind. Strengthen your servant Sharon during this time that she may have the strength to bear up under this and that she may be encouraging and helpful to her sister. We thank you that you have brought to us Jean and pray that you make us to a blessing to, a blessing to her even as she is a blessing to us. 
And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night coming cometh when no man can work, and when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. But chiefly are we bound to praise thee for the glorious resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and hath taken away the sins of the world, who by his death hath destroyed death and by his rising to life again hath restored to us everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, same way also 
After supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to thee, almighty God, that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou would strengthen us through the same in faith towards thee and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Lord be with you. Bless me, the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon 